uh, coordinated by the McGill Law Journal to discuss the, the themes and work of today. Um, we're glad, we're honored to be here. Uh, here at McGill, of course, we're on the traditional territory of the Ganyakahaga people. People will know that the island of Montreal has been a meeting place for other indigenous nations, including the Algonquin people, for a long time. So we gather uh, today on that land. Uh, for me, the roots of today, as I was thinking about it before coming this morning, go back a long, long way. I had the privilege of serving as editor-in-chief of Volume 46 of the McGill Law Journal. And back then, if we had a special issue, uh, there was no gathering like this. So they clearly made things much better. That the symposium issue that was eventually published will be the fruit of the discussion that brought people together uh, to build connections, to reinforce relationships, to make new friends, to see old ones. Uh, and obviously, of course, it prompts people to have the papers readier earlier than they would have been if it were just an invitation all done remotely. So that makes tons of sense the journal's doing it. And another way for me that this reaches back a long way uh, is that before I was even hired here, uh, I knew of Evan and admired his work. And so it's a real thrill for me to see uh, such an esteemed colleague uh, having his work stimulating a conversation as it will be today. Now many of you know uh, Professor Fox Decent, and you'll know that uh, one of his ways of respecting people is to engage with them robustly uh, and vigorously. Um, and it, I, I do mean that it's a, a sign of great respect. But Evan is one of the toughest questioners when we gather to discuss other people's work. And I trust um, people have come today to return the favor. Um, <laughs> Evan's work has stimulated tremendous responses uh, internationally. Some people have drunk the Kool-Aid poorly uh, and are sort of fully fiduciary uh, in every setting all the time. Others have a few more reservations, and I think today will be an opportunity to kind of sharpen the sense of what is the analytical uh, value of the, the fiduciary idea, what does it help us see better, what does it help us not see so well, uh, so I think it's really exciting to be carrying on that work. It's, it's really, I think, kind of inspiring to see the way Evan has taken some of his ideas, um, worked out initially in a more domestic context, and then to see him leveraging the outwards. In a sense, it's almost like Evan's research trajectory embodies that of this faculty of law, which sort of, over time, I think, has come to be uh, from continuing to be deeply rooted here and in the two legal traditions that were sort of present in Quebec law from the outset, but broadening over time to be reaching out to different traditions, different landscapes, different parts of the planet. So I think that's, there's lots of things that make it very meaningful for me uh, that the McGill Law Journal Symposium this year focuses on the things that it does. Um, so it's great to have you here. Congratulations to the journal and the team. I look forward to seeing the issue eventually. Um, those of you who are visitors today, come back again soon. Uh, there's always lots of stuff going on here. Uh, the journal is always worth looking at. The journal is always worth submitting to. Quelque soit la langue de rédaction de vos textes. Super high impact. Uh, I regularly hear from people who submitted to the journal how great the editorial team was. So keep that in mind as well. So, uh, welcome, have a wonderful day, uh, and we'll see you again here very soon. Dean uh, Lackey pretty much summarized a lot of the ideas and emotions we've been feeling in this event. But I would like to thank you for being here in such a great number today, for your engagement. Euh, vous avez été plusieurs à nous contacter des semaines avant l'événement, des jours avant l'événement, beaucoup de questions, c'est très excitant, euh, ça nous fait très chaud au cœur de savoir que le public est aussi enthousiaste par rapport à ce sujet-là. Um, as the Dean mentioned, we would once again like to recognize the fact that the Gilgamesh University is located on land that has been used as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous people. Um, second thing, so the journal, as many know, is a student-run publication at McGill. Um, we take great pride in the fact that we've always pushed forward theoretical ideas, uh, the idea of trans-systemic, looking at different approaches to law, blending private and public law. Um, this is the fourth big symposium in a series of multiple special events. There are some years where we prefer not to use special issues, um, but this year we're particularly excited about the special issue we'll be releasing. It'll be number 63-4, and so you can expect that probably this summer or late fall to have like, proceedings published. Um, Finally, I'd just like to have a few words about the conference format. So we're trying to have it much more of a discussion than a presentation. So we have three panels, as you can see on the program, uh, fascinating guests. Um, what we're trying to do is each of the speakers will have about 15 to 20 minutes to present their papers. 
then the discussant can go over them with them. And then afterwards, we would really appreciate it if the people in the room can ask questions and develop and explore the ideas as Dean Wendt mentioned. So without further ado, I would like to invite the panelists for panel number one, Human Rights Beyond Borders. Ellen Gray, Shimon Hitner, Kimberly uh, Kraft, and Emma Robinson. Thank you. 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 Beyond Borders, and I'm Colin Gray. I'm delighted to be uh, the chair and this discussant of this panel. Um, I guess we didn't talk about the order. <laughs> okay, well, why don't we start with you, Shemaine? Okay, Shemaine Keitner is a uh, leading authority on international law uh, and civil litigation. Uh, she served as the 27th counselor to the U.S. Uh, sorry, on international law in the U.S. Department of State. Uh, she's authored two books and dozens of articles, essays, and book chapters on questions surrounding the relationship among law, communities, and borders. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in history and literature from Harvard, and a JD from Yale, and a doctorate in inter international relations from Oxford, where you were a Rhodes Scholar. So it's, um, and you will be talking to us about, sorry, um, explaining international acts, the role of legal Merci Colin, et je suis enchantée d'être ici aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup de m'avoir invité. Je suis en train Montréal après many years. So, I, I hope that my remarks will uh, help provide a backdrop to what promises to be uh, a fascinating conversation today uh, and then in the months to come as we uh, refine our symposium contributions. Uh, as you heard this morning, and as you may know, know uh, we're responding to and drawing inspiration from uh, a really fascinating text uh, produced by Evan Fox Decent and Evan Criddle that in turn is in many ways the culmination of, of years of work that each of them has done on the uh, role that fiduciary theory and fiduciary principles can play in illuminating aspects of international law. Uh, in addition to its more traditional role, uh, in helping to elucidate private law relationships. Uh, and so reading their book was a, a really wonderful opportunity for me to think about international law through uh, what is admittedly a, an unconventional lens. And it was extremely thought-provoking in that regard. And as you'll hear, hear uh, from other presenters today, uh, and, and as you know, if you've read the book, they really go chapter by chapter through some extremely interesting uh, challenging and thorny substantive areas of international law. I'm not going to talk as much today about substance, um, but rather uh, to direct our attention uh, more squarely to process. Uh, and my uh, thinking in doing so really draws on an exchange uh, that uh, professors Fox, Lisa, and Criddle had with another pair of fiduciary law scholars, Ethan Lee uh, and Stephen Galoop who uh, take issue with the proposition that fiduciary theory has something useful to say about international law. Uh, based on what is a fairly narrow definition uh, of fiduciary theory. Uh, so in Lieb and Gloob's view, fiduciary duties uh, necessarily entail uh, a duty with respect to process, uh, and in particular uh, entail what they uh, call freestanding deliberative requirements, so requirements about how decisions are made, uh, not just what conduct uh, the decisions produce. Uh, and they argue in a, in a short response piece that they published that international law lacks this, quote, rigorous culture of justification that characterizes other instances where uh, fiduciary theory, in their view, is more directly applicable. So I'd like to suggest uh, that international law does, in fact, uh, contain a rigorous culture of justification, uh, 
that is analogous in some ways and then probably different in others from the cultures of justification that exist uh, with respect to certain domestic law norms. Uh, but that nonetheless, uh, such a culture of justification should not be neglected and in fact uh, can provide uh, an important focus not only for study but also for reflection about international legal practice. And this is something, of course, that Professors Fox, Decent, and Criddle have pointed out already in their response to the Ingaloop, but I think they, uh, in their initial response anyway, focused uh, largely and understandably on the practice of international courts and tribunals, where, of course, justification is the very essence of a legal argument. Uh, and so I, um, picking up where they leave off, would like to focus outside the context of courts and tribunals on uh, areas where we see international legal justification uh, at work, the forms that it takes, the functions it may play, uh, and then I'll set out a few questions that we can maybe bear in mind as we listen to the other presentations today. So my proposition is quite simple. It's that in international law, as in domestic law, the why of state action matters, not just the what of state action. As former U.S. State Department legal advisor Abe Shays wrote years ago, the requirement of justification provides an important substantive check on the legality of action and ultimately on the responsibility of the decision-making process. Sounds pretty fiduciary to me. Uh, in this account, the norm of justification helps ensure that state conduct flows from reasoned decision-making processes even where there is room for disagreement about the precise contours of applicable legal rules. Uh, now, as you heard from Colin, I've just returned from a year and a half of service in the U.S. government, uh, where I worked closely with the uh, legal advisor to the State Department and then uh, his successor, the acting legal advisor. And looking to uh, the speeches and remarks of foreign ministry legal advisors, not just the U.S. legal advisor, I think we start to get a flavor for what this culture of justification entails and some of the forms that it can take. Uh, Ian McLeod, who's a legal advisor of the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, has described the role of the foreign ministry as both, quote, providing good legal advice, drawing on the right expertise, and, quote, engaging with the outside world to explain what the law is and why that is the case. Uh, and in this account, outside world comprises all of us. So it necessarily comprises uh, those whose state is acting. It would also, and I think this foreshadows the presentation you're going to hear in a moment, uh, those in states uh, affected by another state's action. Uh, and uh, finally, it necessarily encompasses other states in the international community who also contribute to the formation of uh, and then are collectively bound by international law. And I'm thinking in this uh, situation particularly of customary international law. So those of you who are students and scholars of international law know well that international law comes in two basic flavors, the customary kind and the treaty kind. And I think particularly with respect to customary international law, which is formed by the consistent practice of states accompanied by a belief in legal obligation the role of the culture of justification is essentially to provide that uh, evidence of that belief, that opinio juris, uh, that assists in crystallizing customary international law norms. And in that regard, even uh, governments or states that are not directly affected by a particular action are often quite interested in the international legal rationale for the action uh, because states in acting are in fact contributing to uh, shaping the rules that govern the conduct of all states. Now foreign ministry legal advisors on a very concrete level uh, have a number of roles and there's some really interesting writing uh, to which I'll refer in my uh, copious footnotes <laughs> about the role of the foreign ministry legal advisor. Uh, but essentially, in delineating for policy clients what options are uh, legally available, uh, one can think sort of of a continuum. There are, of course, options uh, that are not legally available, and it's important to point those out for policy clients. There may be options that uh, are what um, former State Department legal advisor Harold Coe has called lawful but awful. In other words, they fall within the scope of legally available options, but may be highly undesirable from a policy perspective for a variety of reasons. Uh, 
Uh, and then there's a, a category, and I hesitate even to use the term category because this is really a, a very, very thin, thin, thin slice of state practice, but there may be instances, uh, and the 1999 NATO bombing campaign in Kosovo is often cited as one example, where actions are deemed, uh, quote, illegal but legitimate. Uh, and I want to push a little bit more on that category uh, in just a moment. So although customary international law derives its legitimacy and binding force largely from state consent expressed in the form of behavior, this does not mean that international law lacks the culture of justification. And as I mentioned earlier, the important role of opinion juris, uh, although minimized to a certain extent by some positivist international legal scholars, I think continues to provide a really important uh, doctrinal explanation for why justification matters. Uh, and I think layering some sort of fiduciary concept on top of that doctrinal, do doctrinal explanation for the importance of justification could be an additional interesting piece uh, of uh, the project of viewing international law through a fiduciary lens. The term legal diplomacy uh, that I, I used in my title uh, is one that refers more specifically to uh, sharing one's legal understandings, both in private and sometimes in public settings, uh, with uh, partners in other governments. Uh, and I want to take just a moment to quote uh, from a speech by legal advisor Brian Egan before I was his counselor, so I can't claim any responsibility for this, in which he uh, explained the importance of legal diplomacy. And he did so in particular in the context uh, of the counter-ISIL military coalition uh, that the United States uh, helped to engage and, and continues uh, to cooperate with. He said in 2016, legal diplomacy builds on common understandings of international law, while also seeking to bridge or manage the specific differences in any particular state's international obligations or interpretations. Uh, he went on to explain how, uh, in particular with respect to the non-consensual use of force in Syria, uh, which as you know is not backed by a UN Security Council resolution authorizing the use of force, uh, numerous states have submitted what are called Article 51 letters to the UN Security Council explaining uh, the self-defense rationale for their actions in Syria. And so Brian Egan suggested that this collection of letters it in itself constitutes an important source <laughs> of evidence about states' belief with regard to the lawfulness of their actions uh, and their understanding of the international law of self-defense. And even more than that, uh, Egan talked about really what is, to my mind, a sort of discursive notion uh, of the creation uh, of customary international law and the legitimacy, which I think is a word we'll also hear uh, a lot uh, today, uh, of the constraints that international law places on state behavior. Uh, and so he continued, quote, it is not enough that we act lawfully or regard ourselves as being in the right. It is important that our actions be understood as lawful by others, both at home and abroad, in order to show respect for the rule of law and promote it more broadly, while also cultivating partnerships and building coalitions. Even if other governments or populations do not agree with our precise legal theories or conclusions, we must be able to demonstrate to others that our most consequential national security and foreign policy decisions are guided by a principled understanding and application of international law. Now, what happens, uh, and this is sort of the final set of thoughts that I'll offer uh, today, when a state's actions are not straightforwardly reconcilable with accepted international legal rules. In such circumstances, a state has three basic options with respect to public explanation. First, offering a legal rationale and attempting to persuade relevant audiences that its actions can in fact be accommodated within existing legal rules and or that the legal rules should be modified. So one can think then of these Article 51 letters, right, which not only were lodged with the Security Council pursuant to Article 51 procedures when the state uh, is acting based on the self-defense theory, but also some explanation of why uh, self-defense was, in those states' views, uh, a legally available justification for their use of force. Number two, uh, if one is not going to offer a legal rationale, one could offer a policy rationale while attempting to preserve the integrity and binding force of potentially conflicting legal rules. Uh, and in just a moment, I'll quote from the remarks of former State Department legal advisor Mike Matheson at the time of the Kosovo, shortly after the Kosovo action to provide an example of number two. Uh, and number three, of course, is to remain silent. 
So with respect to number two, uh, at the time of the Kosovo intervention in 1999, which as you'll recall was also uh, an intervention not authorized by the UN Security Council, uh, the United Kingdom endorsed uh, the legal theory of humanitarian intervention uh, under international law as a basis for its actions, uh, stating that uh, if action through the Security Council is not possible, in their view, military intervention by NATO is lawful on the grounds of overwhelming humanitarian necessity. Um, however, other some other members of NATO, including the United States, did not go so far as to adopt that legal rationale. Uh, and as acting legal advisor Mike Matheson explained, uh, instead offered uh, the following thoughts. He said there was a broad consensus within NATO that armed action was required to deal with the intoler intolerable atrocities by the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and Kosovo, but also a shared concern that the chosen justification not weaken international legal constraints on the use of force. As a result, he continued, NATO decided that its justification for military action would be based on the unique combination of a number of factors that presented itself in Kosovo without enunciating a new doctrine or theory. Now, that was fine where it stood, um, but of course that hasn't been the last uh, use of force absent Security Council authorization, although um, to be fair, these uses of force have been infrequent. Uh, leading Jack Goldsmith uh, to observe at the time of Russians, uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea uh, that there was much discussion of, quote, the precedential value of the Kosovo non-precedent precedent for Crimea. Uh, so you see how we get tied up in knots uh, when we go for option number two. Uh, there has also much more recently in the blogosphere, as you've seen, been discussion of uh, and criticism of the lack of public explanations and legal justifications uh, for certain countries' actions in Syria. Most recently, uh, Ona Hathaway uh, has taken issue with Israel's failure to offer public legal justifications uh, for what have been up to 17 strikes in Syria during the Syrian civil war, uh, warning that, quote, this silence from the international community and from Israel itself is a worrisome sign for the health of the prohibition on the unilateral use of force and the international legal order that depends on it. Uh, now, Adam Roberts, uh, who's uh, an esteemed international relations scholar and was once described at a conference as the best international lawyer we haven't thought, uh, pushes against the notion that we should have these sort of absolute clear-cut legal rules and, and wrote with respect to Kosovo uh, that law can provide principles, guidelines, and procedures but not always absolute answers. Uh, so the questions that I would leave you with as we discuss more substantive issues today uh, are threefold. Number one, uh, when is public legal justification required in international law? Number two, what forms are most effective for such justification to take and what functions can these different forms of justification perform? Uh, and number three, you know, when is silence golden, so to speak? Uh, when is it uh, permissible for a state not to advance a public legal explanation for its actions? Uh, and then conversely, and something I'd like to explore more in the uh, symposium contribution, although I don't have time to get into today, is how can we ascertain what the optimal degree of transparency is with regard to a state's uh, international legal reasoning? And with regard to that, I'll just flag a recent decision in the United Kingdom uh, technically under the UK's Freedom of Information Act, but relating uh, very much to what is the public interest in disclosure of legal advice provided with respect to the legality of certain drone strikes carried on by the United Kingdom. Uh, and having uh, planted those questions for future thought, I'll turn the microphone back to Colin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shanae. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Kimberly and Edna right away. Um, I'll just, so Kim, uh, Kimberly is senior lecturer uh, in public international law at University College London, um, and she's the co-editor of Current Legal Problems. Um, she joined the faculty at UCL in 2012, and prior to that she had been a lecturer at um, Newnham College uh, and an affiliated lecturer at the Faculty of Law, University of Cambridge where she also did her uh, LLM and her PhD. Um, Kimberly is the author of State Responsibility for International Terrorism, by, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2011. Edmund is a master's and PhD student at uh, University College London, and you're working on 
PhD uh, on international human humanitarian law and the regulation of state support uh, to participants in armed conflict. And Kimberly is one of your directors. So, okay, and I'll turn it over to you. Ever. My voice is a little bit groggy. That is principally because we arrived from London last night and uh, stayed out later than anticipated, which one of the authors of the book under discussion might be responsible for. Um, <laughs> um, first, I want to start by thanking the McGill Law Journal for their really kind presentation uh, and their excellent organization. It's a model of organization. Um, and of course, your professors, Criddle and Fox Decent, for the opportunity to engage with the really interesting account of uh, modern international law. Um, our starting point for our paper uh, is a narrative in common with Professor Criddle's and Fox Decent. Um, it's very hard to teach an international law or research an in international law uh, without being struck often by the shifts in focus, perspective, or paradigm that have happened over the last 70 years. Um, and that shift, of course, is framed in a number of different ways uh, by different scholars, um, in this particular case in fiduciary terms. Um, but certainly there are common elements of these accounts, um, the increasing legal pluralism of international legal actors, uh, the human regarding limitations on the exercise of sovereign power, and an increasing understanding that uh, states' interests are those of their population, as to be distinguished from the interests of governments. Um, and a fiduciary theory of sovereignty um, is certainly one which captures important elements of this paradigm shift. Um, but Ed and I don't quite come to questions of international law from a theoretical perspective if we sort of try to think of a spectrum of uh, legal scholars um, with critical legal theorists on uh, the left, um, straight up legal theorists in the middle, and die hard positivists on the right, Ed and I probably fall somewhere between the legal theorists and die hard positivists. Um, and so when we started to think about how to engage with Professor Criddle and Fox Deason's work, we wanted to both test the, the theoretical construct against a really difficult practical problem, one derived from state practice, but we also wanted to test whether positive international law might not already provide some of the answers, um, or at least point us in the right direction towards post-UN Charter uh, shifts and developments. Um, and part of the reason for wanting to do that is that while these paradigm shifts and, and ways of explaining them are an important part of the international legal narrative, um, we remain acutely aware of the fact that states, through their governments, ultimately need to at least recognize rules in order for those rules um, to be effective or to have any purchase. Um, when I was um, drafting the intro of this paper, there's a footnote in there that I'm uh, embarrassed by, it's very naughty of me, but um, it's, it's in part driven by the news that I was reading uh, on the day while I was drafting it. I, I note that I want to characterize the shifts in international law as those of the 20th century, and um, it's very hard to sort of think about those developments as continuing into the 21st century. I live in the UK with all that's going on over there, and visiting Canada with what's going on in our neighbor to the south it makes it hard to think about um, this sort of story of progress. And when I was thinking about sort of the, the prescriptive possibilities for the fiduciary theory, I pictured, and this is even more naughty, uh, possibly just to be sharing with you, not that I was picturing it, uh, I pictured somebody trying to explain to the Donald that he is a fiduciary of humanity. Um, <clears throat> now, assuming he could pronounce the word, <laughs> Um, and that somebody could manage to take this incredible work and sort of distill it into one page of 14, point, 14 uh, font bullet points. Um, I, I, it strikes me that it would be a stretch to sort of um, get the Donald on board. Now, the fact that some states might not be willing to sort of be, to drink the Kool-Aid, um, isn't obviously a, a reason for rejecting a theory or for criticizing it. And in fact, 
depending on the government, it may even be a reason to wholeheartedly embrace the theory. Um, but uh, we, we are still very mindful that international law, if it's to be effective, it has to guide state behavior and that states need to, to a certain extent, drink the Kool-Aid. Um, so the, the idea behind the paper is to take a particular practice of states, uh, one which really challenges the capacity of the fiduciary uh, theory to respond to, in particular, the competing obligations or duties of states, um, and to see what positive law might offer up in response to that challenge. Um, and we accept that the end result might nevertheless be lex ferenda, um, but the idea is that it's going to be lex ferenda to the extent that it is, informed by um, positive international law or international law that states have already accepted or are in the process of accepting. So by way of legal uh, starting points, uh, we accept, we couldn't really do otherwise, we accept Professors Criddle and Fox Deason's articulation of sovereignty uh, as one which provides that states' principal obligation is towards their domestic population. Um, now they articulate that obligation in fiduciary terms, um, and the obligation is to provide a regime of secure and equal freedom for their own people. You could, of course, articulate uh, that obligation in a number of different ways, but broadly, um, broadly, uh, that seems right. Um, and we also accept their proposition that when states are exercising power abroad, when they're exercising power over foreign <coughs> nationals, um, that they um, owe certain obligations to those foreign nationals. Again, professor, Professors Criddle and Fox Deason characterize those obligations in uh, fiduciary terms, um, and that whether that uh, is so is somewhat of a different question. Um, but the question we're looking at is how do we balance those two sets of obligations, one to a domestic population and another set of obligations which is other regarding, if you will, when those two sets of obligation are in conflict, or not necessarily conflict, but at least in competition. Um, so we've settled on a case study, um, and the case study is of state support for non-state armed groups acting in a foreign, non-international armed conflict, so in NIAC, um, where the state supporting the non-state armed group is doing so with a view to protecting its security at home. And we accept for the purposes of argument's sake um, that it is possible to um, support militarily non-state armed groups abroad with security at home implications, um, so that that would be in discharge, for instance, of the um, supporting state's human rights obligations to protect its domestic population. Um, now, the support to the non-state actors to the extent that it is indeed protecting interests at home, and we take that as a given, um, would be in satisfaction of what professors Criddle and Fox Deason characterize as uh, the state's principal fiduciary obligation to its own uh, population. But in exercising power abroad, even if they are doing so indirectly through support rather than boots on the ground, um, the, the supporting states under the fiduciary theory is also under an obligation to the um, population of the state subject to the NIAC and in whose territory the supporting state is intervening. Um, and we accept that to be the case, that the supporting state is under obligations to the population of the NIAC state. Um, whether these are fiduciary or not is the open question. Um, now, there are, of course, use ad bellum implications to this kind of support, supporting non-state armed groups in foreign armed conflicts abroad. Uh, the International Court of Justice in Nicaragua held that military support to non-state armed groups uh, can be a breach of Article 2.4 of the Prohibition on the Use of Force under the UN Charter. But they did so after having found that the Americans were not acting in a defensive capacity, that they weren't exercising their right of self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. Um, but where the support is defensive, and that is the support that we are dealing with in our paper, that's sort of the starting point of our, our, our um, paper, uh, Professor, Professor Scriddle and Fox Descent characterize that as asymmetrical self-defense. Um, and in terms of the, fiduciary, the uh, sovereignty is fiduciary theory, um, 
it seems to suggest, or my understanding of their work, is that the defending, intervening, supporting state, however you want to characterize them, the state that is supporting non-state actors in another or a foreign armed conflict, um, their theory is that they, that state, the supporting state, is acting as a surrogate sovereign um, in the territory that is subject to the NIAC. So they are effectively just taking the place of the territorial state. Um, and in so doing, they are subject to the same obligations as that territorial state, which professors Criddle and Fox Deason characterize as human rights obligations. So they take the view that when um, a foreign state is acting as a surrogate sovereign in another state's territory, whether because they're engaging in humanitarian intervention or they are um, engaging in asymmetrical self-defense and they apply the surrogate um, a sovereign to both of those cases, where they are acting as a surrogate sovereign, they take the view that human rights law provides the applicable legal framework. Now, this is obviously not the case as a matter of the lex lata, as a, as a matter of the law that as it applies today. Um, a non-international armed conflict in a state's territory shifts the applicable legal framework. Um, so while human rights might continue to apply, it is human rights as interpreted through international humanitarian law. Um, and in respect to very important rights, like the right to life and the right to liberty, it is in fact IHL, International Humanitarian Law, that provides the standard of behavior for states, even though the applicable law is human rights, because human rights is being interpreted through IHL. Um, and so our starting point is that IHL is in fact the applicable legal regime which provides the minimum yardstick of protection for the population that is subject to the NIAC. So we don't accept the view that human rights law um, is the, uh, is the uh, minimum yardstick of protection. We also argue that requiring the intervening state, or characterizing, maybe not requiring, characterizing the intervening state, the state that's supporting non-state actors for its own defensive purposes, characterizing that state as a surrogate sovereign fails to capture the, the competing obligations that that state is under, because that state is acting to protect its domestic interests at home, its security at home, and exercising power in foreign territory. Um, so unlike the territorial sovereign, the sovereign, the state in whose territory a NIAC is unfolding, that state has obligations to its own population principally. The state that's intervening is doing so to protect interests at home while projecting power abroad. So in fact, there are competing obligations here. Um, and because the fiduciary theory doesn't quite seem to capture those competing interests, um, we turn to positive law obligations. Um, obligations that are relevant to, but perhaps adjacent to, um, the sorts of obligations that states might be under when they are supporting non-state actors in a foreign armed conflict. Um, we think that where we get to with positive law, and this is ter it's still very much a work in progress, so we're still sort of drawing out the threads of analysis, but we think that where we get to as a matter of positive law is a risk-based theory, that states in supporting non-state armed groups abroad can't increase the risk that those armed actors will commit breaches of international humanitarian law, and we rely on IHL as the applicable legal framework, of course, instead of international human rights law. Um, so we're just gonna sort of walk you quickly through the different bits of positive law that we're um, looking at, and then uh, uh, draw some um, very, very broad work in progress conclusions, um, and then hopefully we can have a really robust discussion I can see that Evan has been jotting things down, um, so I look forward to your comments, certainly. Um, so starting with the ordinary meaning of common article one, I pass it to Ed. Uh, good morning, and I'll just add my thanks to the organizers and to the authors. Um, it's uh, great to be here and uh, to be having this conversation. Um, so underpinning a lot of our thinking is the sort of starting point on the positive law basis of what might be described as the <laughs> duties uh, on support is common article one of the Geneva Conventions. Um, so this is quite a well-known obligation. Uh, states have undertaken to respect the conventions, i.e. comply with them themselves, but also to ensure respect for them, uh, which sort of suggests some element of getting <coughs> us to comply um, in, in some form and to some extent. And it's that second part that sort of provides the textual hook for us um, for identifying what the fiduciary responsibilities of supporting uh, states would be. 
Uh, obviously, that's subject to the fact that, in a sense, getting sort of near IHL compliance probably falls quite a long way short of a regime of security called freedom for humanity and kind of the particular fiduciary model um, that, that's being sort of discussed in, in this work. Uh, but as Kimberly says, it's, um, I think that flows, in our view, from the positive law as to how far IHRL can go and can't go when it comes to the regulation of armed conflict. Um, and perhaps some of this could also be seen as reflecting some of the points made in, in the book about sort of state of emergency and, and some of those other kind of considerations. Um, obviously trying to sort of build on these two words, ensure respect, is quite a sort of major undertaking um, and it's a part of the debate that's been going on for uh, many decades now in one shape or form. Um, I mean, some of the options that are kind of relevant, I suppose, to this debate as to what the effect of the might be, there's a sort of well-established or well-long-argued view um, from Fritz Kalsdoven that essentially saw this as simply a kind of moral exaltation, which wasn't to say it was unimportant, but, but it didn't really sort of play out at the realm of sort of positive, effective positive law. Um, that probably ties less well to the kind of the idea of the planetary model that's being discussed in this case, although in a sense that exhaustive policy isn't uncharacteristic of, of some elements of, uh, of domestic planetary law. Um, at the other extreme, you could have the argument which the ICRC has been putting forward, which sees this as being an obligation um, on all, the, all states, in a sense, to cooperate and to use their sort of um, influence to bring IHL violations in a life to an end. Um, so that sort of, you know, fits in quite well with this model of the sort of shared responsibility of states um, as fiduciaries of all humanity, kind of collectively, in a bit the same way as it's discussed in the book for humanitarian intervention. Um, but in between, the particular point of interest to us is the range of options which focus particularly on supporting states um, and focusing either on an obligation on them to use the influence that they have from providing the support um, to kind of push the party that they're supporting to um, improve its compliance with IHL um, or, and or uh, to stop providing the support if it reaches the stage where there's sort of too high a risk that, um, that it will be misused and result in uh, IHL breaches. I think either of those actually can still, as general concepts, be seen in terms can sort of fit within the descriptive model, at least of a, a fiduciary theory, um, that, that these particular duties are imposed by virtue of the state's capacity or its conduct, uh, albeit on a sort of individual model rather than a collective one. Um, the interaction of those duties creates a lot of difficulties, we've kind of discussed both of this in, in the paper and can we just touch on them now, um, as well as the sort of problems of uh, balancing duties to own people versus um, those in the territory of the state. Uh, there's also all of the complexity about what is actually the better way to proceed. Is it better to continue providing the support in order to try and influence, or is it better to cut off and sort of prevent the, the flow of arms and other material into the conflict? Um, Obviously, the two words, ensure respect, don't really start get coming that far into to answering the this by themselves. Um, so it, it's then worth turning a bit to some of the other areas and some of the ways in which people have developed or supplemented that concept uh, since. Which, um, so one of the one of the sort of supplementary um, uh, means of interpreting respect and ensure respect under Common Article One emerges from the International Court's decision in Nicaragua, where it viewed um, uh, the CA1 obligation um, bearing on supporting states, so states that are supporting non-state actors operating in a foreign armed conflict, it viewed that obligation as one of non-encouragement, that states are prohibited from encouraging breaches of IHL. Um, and in assessing compliance with the obligation of non-encouragement, um, the court looks to whether or not the state was aware of allegations of IHL breaches. And that's in fact a really a quite low standard of foreseeability, aware of allegations of IHL breaches. And one of the things that we're trying to sort of tease out here, um, and this, this fits in very well with the idea of justification basically, um, but the flip side of that is whether states are under an obligation not only to inform, but also to inform themselves, basically. Whether or not states are under an obligation to do their due diligence um, while they're supporting or before they begin supporting uh, armed state actors. Um, the other uh, positive law obligation that we're drawing on a little bit um, is, uh, is in the human rights law context, so at least speaks to um, uh, uh, what the fiduciary theory uh, considers to be the applicable legal framework. Um, and that's the obligation of non refoulement, which not the refugee law obligation of non refoulement, which is one that um, 
uh, professors Criddle and, and Fox Deason deal with quite a bit in their book, but the obligation of non refoulement in the torture context. Um, and the reason we're drawing on that particular obligation is because it effectively requires states or, or prohibits states from behaving when their particular behavior will increase the risk that another actor will breach international law. Another actor for whom that state is not at all responsible. So it prohibits state A from extraditing or surrendering an individual to state B when there's a serious risk that state B will take that individual and torture them. Um, and what we're exploring is whether or not you can, you can derive a, a more general obligation from that, an obligation not to behave when that behavior increases the risk of breaches of international law. Now, of interest for our purposes is that the non refoulement obligation um, is in some respects absolute, which is to say that courts have recognized that this question that we're asking about balancing of interests competing interests, that that's completely irrelevant in respect of non refoulement when the risk is of torture, when the risk is of a youth Kogan's breach, basically. Um, whereas courts have been significantly more open to the balancing of interests where the risk of unlawful behavior is our lesser breaches. And so that's part of what we're, we're pulling on in terms of whether or not at the very least you can draw from international law an obligation not to increase the risk of use Kogan's breaches. In the context we're looking at, that would look, that would look something like states being prohibited from supporting, um, where their support increases the risk that, for instance, non-state actors are directly targeting civilians. Um, so you would be looking at a much smaller category of IHL breaches here if you're limiting yourself to use Kogan's. Um, but nevertheless, if you couple that with an obligation to inform oneself, particularly based on a standard of awareness of allegations, um, that starts to look like a quite important possible obligation that would restrict the behavior of supporting states. Um, and that, that reading of non refoulement uh, might be um, further supported by Article 41 of the ILC's Articles on State Responsibility, the obligation not to cooperate in um, uh, breaches of use coping as norm. So those are some of the um, uh, the threads of, of, of well-accepted positive law that we're trying to draw on to, um, to, to put some flesh on this idea um, that states do indeed have, as a matter of positive law, an obligation um, uh, in respect of the populations of, of, uh, of uh, states in whose territory there's a NIAC and in respect of which they are supporting materially one of the armed actors. Um, and then there's a last body of law, which is actually really interesting, I think, and I will pass this over to Ed, and then we will conclude because we have five minutes. Um, so it's the, this was specifically in the arms trade regulation field. Um, so it's the, uh, the EU common position, which we probably won't get into here, but also the arms of the UN arms trade treaty. Um, and and they both they both struck us as quite sort of interesting as examples of states proactively embracing and codifying what does what, what I think can reasonably be described in terms of a fiduciary approach, sort of functionally speaking. So I mean, you have the ATT, which um, is, is built in a sense, or the IHL bits of it are built on the Common Article 1 obligation to respect and ensure respect, which is preferred to in the treaty. Um, they include a sort of duty of care and skill in a sense, so an obligation to um, investigate how the arms that you're providing um, are going to be used and what the risks are associated with that. Um, and then substantively they have a kind of split, again, focusing on um, the IHL sort of elements between the core duties not to provide weapons that sort of would be used, as it puts it, for war crimes, um, and then also, which, which are simply sort of uh, are, are absolute obligations in a sense, um, and then those other obligations uh, where the state is allowed to balance, you know, in a sense, by um, considering whether or not if they provide the weapons there is an overriding risk that it will result in serious violations of IHL, <coughs> which then sort of both allows but sort of limits the balancing that, that the fiduciary, as it were, is allowed to do. So um, it, it sort of it's better viewed, I think, as taking um, the position that you can potentially balance some amount of risk against uh, factors like human security, international peace and security, and that kind of thing, um, which, of course, in some respects, weakens this and throws you back onto some of the difficult questions that we've had before, but also does reflect that kind of model of constrained discretion, which I think is sort of inherent in how the, the fiduciary model would, uh, would be expected to work. Um, 
all of this is of course achieved within the sort of you know traditional state consent route. Um, of course, if one were then to try and um, sort of find these as derived from the character of sovereignty itself, that would open up the door to finding obligations here on the states that haven't ratified the treaty, like the US, Russia, China, and as of today, Canada, or uh, they, they will be soon, um, which would be a, a great thing, but, but of course, with all the difficulties in persuading them to um, comply with something that they haven't actually signed up to. Um, so just to conclude very quickly, uh, so I think Kimberley sort of spelled out some of the areas of agreement in terms of the, the duty to, uh, primary duty to the state's own people, so sort of providing support, but also the duties that it owes to the people who are affected by the support it's providing. Um, and perhaps the area of disagreement where we're going to focus on IHL rather than um, IHR rather than surrogacy idea. Um, just to sort of raise a couple of thoughts in conclusion that really came out of uh, some of the other aspects of the duty model, I think one thing should, Whatever way we look at this and the balances involved, I think we end up with some really difficult questions and that, of course, isn't fatal for the fiduciary model because it may be that in the end the right answer is that the difficult decisions are made by states in their fiduciary capacity. And I do wonder whether the whole kind of procedural sort of justification argument is particularly there and whether or not there are not substantive but sort of procedural obligations about how states make and how they explain these decisions, um, which could be useful in kind of taking further regulation without imposing a greater level of constraint than is uh, possible. Um, and I think I'll leave at that stage. Do you want to hear some more now? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, thanks very much, Kimberly and Edward. Um, and Elena, I don't, is the idea that I would ask a question now? Or just you can open ask it up? questions. It's up to you. You have five oh, minutes, wow. ten minutes now. And, okay. Uh, right. some time for the room, too. Yes. Well, so I do have one question, which I think might be sort of a general question for the panel. And that is just to sort of use sort of a familiar formula. Like, how do you see the interaction? So both, all the presentations, or the two presentations, were really much focused on practice. Sort of the actual practices in international law of legal diplomats and actual sort of positive, uh, positive obligations in the law. And I just sort of wondered how you view this sort of investigation of practice as relating to the theory. You know, um, so Shemaine, you talked about how there actually are sort of practices of justification that go on, and you're using that to push back against Lieb and Galoob. Uh, Lieb and Galoob suggest, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, that those requirements of justification, the deliberative requirements, are requirements. And I guess I'm not sure from your presentation if these practices are things that a state do, or if they have an opinion of yours that they have to provide a basis for an opinion of yours. You know? So that's kind of my question for you, and sort of how that, for, in your case, I think, helps defend the fiduciary theory. And in, in your case, Kimberly, I think that question is how sort of the kinds of conflicts and uh, and sort of disconnects between actual positive law and the prescriptions of the fiduciary theory as it's laid out in the book. Um, I don't know, like, what's how does that help us interrogate the theory in your view? So that's just kind of like a beginning question. Um, sure. Um, so yeah, no, that that's great, right, Colin? I think it would be an overstatement to say that there's a customary international law obligation to provide uh, a public explanation. Um, except in, in uh, more uh, limited circumstances, for treaty-based circumstances, for example, the Article 51 uh, you know, requirement of, of notifying the Security Council as soon as possible, and these sorts of things. Um, that said, I, I think um, it is note noteworthy that states do offer rationales, um, and I think there is, uh, and again, of course, this gets into a whole set of debates about customary international law methodology, uh, which is currently a major project being undertaken by the International Law Commission, among others. Uh, but the, the importance of opinion of to customary international law formation, I think, suggests that there may not be a requirement to offer an explanation, but it's obviously um, often in states' interest to offer explanations to the extent that they want to be significant contributors to and shapers of uh, the law by which they're bound. Um, you know, I, I think it is, uh, you know, obviously a tremendously central question, the extent to which fiduciary theory um, can sort of be, be the answer to or the guide to every aspect of, of what we're talking about here. Um, I, I 
do think that um, it is a useful lens to be able to sort of open up some of these questions. Um, but I, I think one can affirm its value as a useful lens without necessarily feeling that that needs to entail uh, sort of linking up every possible requirement one could think of to, to either an actually existing or uh, aspirational requirement under international law. Um, so, I suppose I'd probably look at it in two senses. One of them is the kind of, the more I suppose, uh, the fiduciary theory of the sort of, almost a source of law, so it means derived from sovereignty. And I think, to us in a sense, that probably what these cases are suggestive of are the limits for how far that can be taken while remaining a sort of effective system of, of regulation, um, and particularly you know, sort of the, the ideas of trying to regulate these issues through IHRL when this structure has been kind of partially already built by states. Um, but I, I think the, the, what I found particularly interesting though is on the other side, which is the sort of critique and the kind of the, the more let's render um, project, because I think in terms of both understanding kind of where, how far we've already come, um, you can sort of look at, I guess, assess, you know, the extent to which the, the demands of the theory have been responded to, and I think in some areas you can find this model which has emerged, which seems to include both kind of the flaw which rules out certain forms of conduct altogether, um, and then this kind of respect for the kind of continuing ability of the state to balance this by these obligations is actually mirrors quite well, um, and potentially then of course also that can provide the way to look at sort of possible areas of future development in which. Actually, I think almost at the moment, I think the most obvious, the most interesting example might be the kind of procedural obligations kind of angle, but on that side of the sort of fiduciary role and what you would expect from it can help to inform um, where states might be able to kind of develop more further, or sorry, states or the ICJ or whichever actors you think are sort of relevant for developing those. Um, just to add that I, I think it also it depends a little bit on what, what you think the purpose of theory is. Um, so is it meant to describe things as they are? Um, the fiduciary theory certainly does that to some extent and then not to others. Is it meant to inspire? Um, I read this book thinking to a certain extent, oh, if, if, oh, one, okay, let's, <laughs> let's do that. Sure, that's, so, so I think how much you can sort of, whether you can interrogate from what angle, what, what is the purpose of the interrogation, it depends what you think theory is for. I, I as I confessed slash, well, just confessed, um, I'm more of a positivist on, on um, the grand uh, uh, scale of things. Um, and so I, I tend to think that these theories are um, descriptive. They can help us understand things that have happened um, through a new lens in a way that's very helpful to understand particular developments, but also I think they can be aspirational, inspirational, um, uh, uh, even if not ultimately effective. With greatest respect. So at least we end at 12.15, I believe. Right. So we have 15 more minutes for questions. Um, well, thanks to all of you for your presentations. If you'll forgive or tolerate a question from Elena. Um, is the fiduciary context less likely to countenance situations in which, for example, non-combatants are systematically denied a Geneva prote protections or and uh, in which uh, countries can allow torture to be conducted on their behalf in third countries. Um, I think pro without sort of having traced everything through, I, I would expect that the fiduciary theory gets you very close to where positive law gets you on, on questions of, of um, serious disregard for the protections set out in the Geneva Convention. So, and of course, the part of the answer is in your question, which is the protections are set out in the Geneva Conventions. The fiduciary theory, as far as I, as far as I've sort of understood it, doesn't provide for um, any better enforcement mechanisms of international law than general international law does. So in that regard, where you have um, non-compliance, um, I don't know that the fiduciary theory helps us 
any more than the positive law underlying it. So. Yes. <clears throat> Two quick questions, one on each presentation, which were uh, fascinating and full of rich material. Um, for Professor Kindner, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about covert action and unacknowledged uses of force, which I think you gestured towards in your presentation, but didn't really talk about it in, in, in great depth. Um, and it, it seems to me that they are sort of deeply problematic from a perspective of justificatory obligations, um, because if you're not um, acknowledging that you're engaging in something, then you're, by definition, not offering a legal justification for it, or any kind of justification for it, like even a non-legal one. Um, but, you know, moving a step beyond that, I, I'm sort of, uh, I can't decide for myself how to think about these, uh, because in one sense, if covert actions remain um, uh, truly exceptional, then I suppose they don't unwind the entire mechanism that you're talking about in terms of justificatory practices. But if you think in sort of a Kantian vein of universalizing them, you can't universalize them because then the entire structure of custom and the international legal system collapses because then there'd be no justification because everything would be unacknowledged and just everyone would be saying, no, I didn't do that, or I'm refusing to say whether I did that. Um, and is, you know, at what point does the, is there a problem for moving to exceptional and um, when you talk about, for example, a discrete military action, that would be one thing, but if a country refuses to acknowledge an entire armed conflict, like just the entire IAC or NIAC, we're not acknowledging it, um, at that point if you cross the sort of line where it's, where it's problematic from the perspective of this justificatory obligation. Um, and on, on the uh, presentation from Professor Trapp and Mr. Robinson, um, I was curious if you could say a little bit more about uh, mental states in terms of um, uh, the obligation not to encourage violations of, of IHL. I'm betraying my uh, background as a, as, a, as a criminal law scholar here and talking about mental states, which can be a little bit weird in terms of states, but even when we talk about state responsibility, there is a sense that um, something like a mental state matters. You refer to it as a risk-based theory that could be though consistent with sort of more of a recklessness or dolus eventualis scheme or um, a, a much broader or, 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 or wider standard of, of negligence as well. Um, which would, I think, capture a lot more situations than, than recklessness. I was wanting to say a little bit about that. Um, thanks, Jensen. That's a great um, sort of category of acts to think about. Um, and I'll put a new section to the paper, you know, considering that. I mean, Alexander Crane has a really interesting article on covert acts um, to, you know, that I commend to folks who are interested in this. Um, certainly, you know, the kind of Kosovo type category of acts that I was alluding to um, in my remarks uh, is sort of the, the, the different paradigm, right? Where it's sort of the, a, a, an um, indisputable act uh, that is clearly attributable to the states that have conducted it, and then the question is, you know, whether a, a legal as opposed to a policy rationale is, is offered. Um, the other two examples that come to mind are, are espionage, and so we always, we always struggle with this in terms of, of espionage under international law, right? Um, on the one hand, uh, the prohibition on torture that's been referenced uh, is, is certainly continues to be violated um, by certain countries, but nobody, uh, and this continues to be the case, nobody says that torture is lawful, nobody uh, denies that it violates international law to commit torture, and so this is an example where what states say actually does matter tremendously. Um, with respect to espionage, it's an interesting category in which you know all states conduct espionage, yet uh, which you know one would think perhaps then leads to a suggestion that espionage must somehow be internationally lawful, uh, and yet uh, you know by and large spies when uh, apprehended are, are prosecuted, but they're not prosecuted under international law, right? They're prosecuted under uh, the territorial states' domestic law. Um, another category um, is. Uh, you know, acts that are, um, whose effects may be visible, um, or that, that may be deemed to have occurred, uh, but where there are tremendous attribution problems. So here, of course, I'm thinking of the cyber context, um, which also, I think, poses real challenges in terms, and again, just thinking off the top of my head here, in terms of a, a sort of justification theory where uh, a state may, may, may or may not have reasons for wanting to uh, claim responsibility for a particular cyber. Act. Um, so no, no answers to offer, but I think that it's a really fruitful area to explore and kind of fleshing this out. So thank you for that.
and yeah, also thank you for that question. So it is, it is that spectrum is basically a little bit of what we're trying to work out in that section. Um, what's of interest is that uh, the court in Nicaragua, when they when they articulated CA one, Common Article one, in terms of an obligation not to encourage, what they were addressing, the factual matrix that they were looking at, was the publication by the Americans and disseminate so the CIA dissemination to the Contras of a psychops manual, which effectively did encourage. So there was active encouragement rather than um, uh, sort of responding to awareness of allegations, and yet nevertheless. Within that section, when they're talking about the obligation not to encourage, they discuss it in terms of awareness of allegations. Um, so, so what the court is doing is actually already a little bit hard to figure out because the awareness of allegations should be irrelevant. This isn't that they sort of are supporting them generally, but they're aware that they might be behaving naughtily. It's that the Americans, in fact, handed them a manual that said, um, um, "Off you go. Here's um, a blueprint for war crimes." So. So what the court is doing in that case is slightly strange, and therefore deriving obligations from it is tricky, I think, because they, they're they doing, they're responding to something that is not in fact the factual circumstances um, that uh, were put forward to them. Um, and, and I think sort of active encouragement is the obvious case. Um, awareness of allegations strikes me as something getting us close to recklessness, and then if you can derive sort of an obligation to inform oneself, you have potential to, to get towards the negligence standard. So I, I, th I think that is exactly the spectrum we're looking at. How much you can tease out of Nicaragua, given that on one reading of the case, most of it is obiter, is, is the challenge, basically. Maybe just a two finger on that. Yeah. Um, not to make it past the mic too much, but um, the other sort of interesting mens rea aspect to the, the sort of aiding and assisting dilemma, right? Uh, of course, is so in complicity terms or in Article Six. Correct. Terms, yeah. No, more in it is. Uh, well, but also I think under under your framework is, uh, in order for certain acts potentially to constitute war crimes, uh, they also need to be accompanied by a certain mens rea. And so, what what degree of awareness of um, of the you know potential perpetrators' mens rea can we impute uh, to the provider of assistance? Yeah. I think there's sometimes sort of a um, Assumption that such information is readily available or discernible, um, but but of course that's not the case. I think what's interesting is that so the difficulty is that when you're talking about war crimes, you're talking about individual criminal responsibility, and the mens rea is particularized and higher. And when you're talking about IHL breaches, as state IHL breaches, but equally non-state actor IHL breaches, if we can treat them similarly, the the mens rea standard is much more objective and, and lower. So. So the question is also whether or not you character or you frame this obligation in terms of an obligation not to support breaches of IHL or an obligation not to support war crimes. Because if you're framing it in war crimes terms, I think you're importing the higher mens rea threshold, and that in fact decreases the level of the state's obligation because they have to be aware of a higher mens rea. Whereas if you import just the you can't support IHL breaches, you maintain the mens rea at a lower threshold. So there's it's we're still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, of course, exactly the argument the UK government used when it faced litigation on Iran's claims to, um, to Saudi Arabia was that essentially the requirement that they should not do it is because of the risk of serious violations of IHL, going after serious violations, equal to war crimes, and that will also have to prove the hard threshold as well. Yes. Um, um, thank you very much for these, uh, these great and uh, stimulating presentations. She made, uh, to your list of questions that we might get, uh, uh, one that strikes me also is sort of relevant in that context. And they say, of course, uh, uh, you're pushing on a wide open door about the culture of justification. It's, uh, you know, it's a mother's note for uh, for me who uh, grew up on uh, you know, the lot of David Eisenhower's who brought us from South Africa and uh, had to marry me. Uh, so it's, I, I think it's just great generally. One of the questions I've been wondering about is to what extent can we accept? Justifications that are offered publicly but after the fact, and then ratified in some public forum as an adequate justification uh, or as an adequate expression of the publicness of the act that's being, uh, being justified. When in some circumstances, such as emergency circumstances or a crisis, um, it's just not it's just not possible, perhaps, to offer an ex ante justification. So um, I think that's something for us to think about. You can, you're welcome to respond to that. Uh, for uh, Kimberly and Ed, well, you, you've essentially, you've, you've articulated precisely uh, 
five-year project that Evan and I are now working on, <laughs> which is how do how do we how do we understand the competing poles on a sovereign state uh, toward its own people and towards humanity, especially when these conflict. So we have been, we have started on this path. We have a we have a paper called uh, Guardians of Legal Order, and so we draw analogies and look to, for example, the obligations that lawyers have as officers of the court or guardians of legal order to do certain minimal things, to not mislead the court, for example, to turn over evidence that they have to turn over, while at the same time acting as zealous advocates for their clients. So you can see the analogy to, uh, to a state. So I just uh, I wanted to thank you for the, uh, uh, for the contribution to say it's, uh, uh, it's, it's well received. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. Well, can I maybe just pick up on that uh, specifically? Because I thought uh, it, it is uh, you know, one of the things I struggle with a bit with a theory is you know what happens when there's several beneficiaries of the uh, fiduciary duty, uh, and I think it is one of the real, really interesting central tensions in the book. Uh, and what Evan just said reminded me of I mean, the, the justification of, of the legal, the role of the legal advisor specifically as someone who is both arguing to the government and, and, and uh, representing the government abroad, but is also uh, not an officer of the court, but a sort of, you know, a fifth column for international law and the invisible column for international laws, and as we know, with the torture memos, etc., kind of held to account uh, sort of both ways. I mean, you have to give good legal advice to the prince, but you can't, you know, do that in ways that would entirely sacrifice a sort of broader professional uh, allegiance, and I know this was an issue also in the run-up to the to the invasion of Iraq in the UK, and you know the extent to which uh, uh, you know you sort of propose different lines of argument, the sort of several layers of memo, depending on whether this is for external or internal consumption. So I think it's an interesting way of the fiduciary duty, if nothing else, of legal advisors uh, to kind of think about these issues very concretely. And the other quick point was uh, to, to uh, Edmund Kim. Um, and it's also tangentially a point on, on the book more generally. So I think sometimes when I read it, I felt, and, you know, I'm international lawyer, I'm sort of happy to, to, for international law to be invested with all kinds of virtues, but there's a risk sometimes, of, I think, of overloading that both as literal, uh, particularly when it comes to obligations to, let's say, distant aliens not on your territory. I realize international law probably does argue, arguably require sovereigns to you know, be mindful of the consequences of their act. But here, I think one interesting relay is constitutional, right? And sort of uh, 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 constitutional arguments that your state should not behave in certain ways, extraterritorially, in ways that, that affect aliens. We have a case in Quebec now, uh, or in, in Canada, uh, uh, on an arms sale to uh, Saudi Arabia. And the argument isn't being conducted primarily under international law, although partly, but it's also mostly just a charter argument, right? That it kind of became government is selling weapons to uh, a repressive regime is sort of violating constitutional compact, which Canadians have a legitimate interest in sort of, you know, in, I suppose certain things not being done in their name, but would be violations of human rights if they were carried out domestically. So I think maybe there's an interesting sort of dynamic relationship between the Constitution and the Constitution. Can I just add, sort of, there's also the feature of sort of the, the um, foreign legal advisor. Um, the added complication to that is, um, this is maybe just a UK and US practice, but it's the foreign legal advisor coming back into the academy and I'm going to use the word peddling because that's the word I want to use, but I realize it might be controversial. Peddling the theory of their government, but now under the guise of academic sort of neutrality, basically. That this is what the law is because when I was advising the Foreign Office, this is what we decided the law is. So in terms of justification, you have this added layer of um, foreign legal advisors sort of coming back as academics and sort of saying, well, isn't this interesting? My research suggests that the law is precisely what it was when I was in the foreign office and et cetera. And I think that actually complicates more how we, who do we rely on? And do we, you have to be really careful in what capacity or what hat they're wearing um, in looking at whether or not they're justifying after the fact, et cetera, which I think makes it 
makes your work a lot more complicated, possibly. <laughs> um, that actually, I don't think it's that complicated at all. I mean, um, when uh, a legal advisor is speaking on behalf of a government, that constitutes a practice. When he or she is speaking in a private capacity, it doesn't. Uh, you know, the, the two people who kind of sort of come to mind as, as having to a certain extent, although not fully, maybe Warren both had to be, I presume we're thinking about Daniel Bethlehem in the UK context, and then perhaps Harold Poe in the US context. Interestingly, um, I mean, Harold Poe, uh, as many of you may know, in writing has, has been quite a strong proponent of the humanitarian intervention theory that the US uh, government to date has not embraced. So, um, so not, I think that sort of as as subsidiary sources of law, or and because they're sort of if you think of this, you know, the, the invisible um, uh, academy of international lawyers sort of thing feeding into the interpretations of the law, then coming back around into legal memos that are sort of that there there is sort of a feedback loop. I, I think that um, there's a, a tremendous tendency, and actually we were talking earlier about clerkships, uh, and I found this when I clerked as well. A tremendous tendency of. of uh, those of us who are academics to overestimate the extent to which practitioners rely on our work in that in that setting. Um, so, so I, again, I'm, 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 I'm not that concerned, which isn't at all. I mean, I'm an academic primarily. You know, it's not at all to um, minimize the tremendous importance of that work. But uh, but I think that it, you know, it, its importance lies um, not primarily in, in driving practice. Um, what I what I was going to say in response to sort of Fred's. Uh, and uh, Evan's very helpful thoughts. I mean, uh, and again, we can get into specifics. Uh, in, in the paper, I've been planning to talk a little bit more about the <coughs> profile inquiry, which I think was a fascinating example of um, probing in a, in a very public way what were the legal justifications uh, offered at the time and the legal advice that the UK government was given, and then the, the rationale that it ultimately offered, uh, as some of you will know, notwithstanding. Uh, some, some of the uh, foreign office lawyers thinking very strongly that international law did actually not provide a basis uh, for the United Kingdom's participation in the Iraq War uh, in, in 2003. Uh, with respect to the torture memos, and again, depending on the length of this contribution, I was thinking of getting in a little bit to a interagency process. Uh, I mean, those came, at, as you all know, from the Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department, and, and what has come to light uh, subsequently was um, you know, I think one of one of the reasons that they read the way they did is precisely because the State Department legal advisor was kept entirely out of the process, uh, and so that actually um, shows the tremendous importance of bringing in uh, international lawyers within government to that deliberation process. Um, there's been some interesting writing, again in the U.S. context, with which I'm most familiar, about the interagency lawyers group uh, that has, uh, you know. Um, Specifically, the task of, of interagency coordination among the lawyers, as opposed to among the policy people, um, which I think has perhaps played a tremendously valuable role. Um, and then, to, to Evan's point, the question is, you know, when do you offer ex ante versus ex post justification? And I think that's where this sort of idea of, of a culture of justification uh, needs to, to be subdivided into at least two components: the ex ante and the ex post. Uh, and, and, and I think, by and large, the ex ante. Uh, is not public. I mean, it does take the form of, of you know, what Fred was, was talking about, the sort of internal advice, deliberations, counseling role. Uh, and then the ex post uh, is, you know, in awareness, in consultation with interagency colleagues and, and on behalf of the government, in awareness of the law shaping role of statements that are made. And so they do serve different functions. I think uh, the Abe Shea's quote that I mentioned in my initial remarks relates in a way more to the ex-ante role, that the sort of um, influence that this requirement of justification plays in the decision-making process. Uh, and to that extent, it does have a very sort of, if not constitutional law, sort of administrative law flavor of kind of what, what kinds of processes produce, you know, kind of the outcomes with the most integrity in government decision-making generally, whether it's with respect to a domestic law issue or a, an international law issue. Um, but then the sort of a penuliarist component of customary international law formation means uh, that I think in, in many circumstances, although as I suggested, perhaps not every single circumstance, um, some degree of ex post explanation is extremely useful. Well, let me just thank you, and thank, all, thank you and thank all the questioners and thank the panelists, Kimberly, Ed, and uh, sorry, Shemaine. And uh, it's been a tremendously fascinating first panel for the day. Thank you.